here again um yesterday i put out a new magic on a budget episode and it was a three-hour episode however the last i don't know 50 40 some minutes it was just music um some of the music i played and it was just to fill up the gap to actually say i had a three-hour show but obviously not really and for anybody who was downloading this who doesn't have those songs may want those songs or whatever well if they downloaded that episode well now they have that music on there and because i fixed my music problem from sounding shitty yeah, there you go so a um, few things. Um, the first time I bought the package, the smaller package, the first episode I put out, it cut out all the beginning stuff before my first recording. Um, and it was everything I did live. Now, my first ceremonial witchcraft episode of, of uh, when I bought the package, the biggest episode, um, where I had a bunch of recordings in there and shit like that, 
I went live prior to um, all the recordings. And I haven't actually checked that one out yet to see if it played well. But yesterday's, I talked a lot a bit before the Grant Morrison 45-minute um, long thing I put on there. Um, interview, uh, seminar, disinfo, convention, whatever it was. And all of that was cut out. Um, okay, and I didn't have a recording place there before. So I don't know I don't know who makes those choices or if it's um, me when I don't uh, hit a certain button for the ads to uh, – because the same thing happened, um, like I said, when I did uh, fucking way back when. I want to say it's the uh, number seven or nine episode on Ceremonial Witchcraft when I finally bought a package. It was available for the ad revenue and all that. They put uh, two Subway ads on there, and it killed about eight minutes of my shit. And it was the first episode when I, I thanked everybody for watching. Because at that point, I had, uh, I forget how many, but like 40 or 50 people, or downloads rather. I was very grateful for that. And that's what sparked me to buy a package so I could do 45-minute long lessons. So um, the three last lessons before I got into my first manifestation, I didn't have to do in three episodes. Because you give you 15-minute 15, um, 15 minute time frames. So... But the same thing happened. My episode ended up being 37 minutes long. And I don't remember how long the episode I made the other day. But I killed the time right to the three hour mark. So maybe that's the problem. And because I know the first time I did the ceremony of witchcraft. I only recorded for about two hours. So I think when you do the full three hours. They actually end up cutting some off. for the To place the ads and all that in there. So it may have it cut off probably about 10 minutes of my shit. And it's probably because they're probably you know, 5 to 10 minutes of ads in there at some point so they had to cut it off from somewhere so it could play on the show i don't see why i can't play before and after also there's a place where you can put an intro so i put a small clip of the song spokesman by goldfinger which is supposed to play before i come live i don't know if that has happened or not i'm not able to see it happen when i play my episodes but because it's coming from my same ip address it's probably just noticing that it's the owner doing it so i don't know i really don't know i don't know that's the reason it got cut off as well so um I was going to apologize for that, but you guys don't really know um, what was there. But there was some good information there, and I had some notes written down, so I'll probably get into that later. But today, today is going to be a different episode, but kind of along the same lines. Um, for anybody who's ever watched um, High Percented Magic on YouTube, um, it's a good channel. It gives a lot of good information. Um, in fact, I got a lot of my egregore, servitor, and thought form information from him. Now, he's got some questionable documentaries on there, but I think he puts them on there for, for people to see what the mainstream has put out. Now, there's literally a documentary about a man who, quote-unquote, got cursed by a witch and died in the summer of 1991 due to this curse. Um, they have police on record going to his house, seeing the salt barriers all around the house and writing notes. And, and the first time they went to the house, nothing happened. And the second time, he actually died in the tub of a heart attack. But he was this guy in good shape and all that. And So this person um, who makes High Percent of Magic, um, he's a good guy, I, th I think, anyways. But I think he puts the stuff on there for people to know the stigma and the shit that's against them. Um, the, th the things that you're going to be going up against if you come out and say you're a witch or do magic and shit like that. So I'm going to play, um, it's called The History of the Occult. Um, it hits everything from H. Play Bl Blavatsky to uh, Thoth to um, Hermes, well, Hermes, kind of his Thoth. Um, um, I'm trying to think of all the old guys' and names. Um, Pythagoras, uh, Isaac Newton, it hits on alchemy, um, John D. and Michael Kelly. Um, when they were doing work, uh, technically he was an astrologer for the Queen, which I hit on, and it even talks about him. Uh, I don't like how they talk about H.P. Blavatsky, because I don't know, I really like H.P. Blavatsky. It's one person I don't think I've ever mentioned, or maybe once, I think I mentioned I read her book, and I really like what she may or may not have done. Now, this documentary says that she was against people doing seances um, to call their ancestors, and... From what I know about her, I don't know if that would be true or not, but I wasn't there, so I can't say it is or isn't true. Just like when they say she got um, she got investigated by uh, some paranormal group from England, I want to say, or Britain, or 
of the UK, whatever it was, and they found some spring-loaded thing because she was having seances and there'd be uh, letters materialized in her hand and all that. So I don't know if that's true or not. I tend to believe that, you know, because she was a woman with all this information, uh, supposedly talking to masters of uh, secret societies and them opening up to her and giving the information in a, in a um, anonymous fashion. And uh, her publishing it pissed off a lot of people, especially probably the males at that time, because this, this is a time where women were just kind of told to sit back and shut up and let the man do everything, which is terrible. I know I have two girls and I hope it never comes to that again. And I'm so proud of anytime there's a woman who does something huge for the world society in general, especially when it comes to occult shit, it's going to, it's going to get my attention. So, um, that's the one thing I would say about that. All right. Sorry about that. Kids are coming in asking questions and I didn't want to have to, yeah, I have to do it over their voices. But anyways, so, the shit about H.P. Blavatsky, um, to me, it could be false, it could be true. I don't know. I have no way of knowing. Um, and I don't like when things are said about that because it takes away. Because people, like I said, our society is, is, you know, if one person does something wrong, all their works get fucked up about it because of it. And to me, that's just not fair. That's not, it's not a fair assumption to say everything she done is all not worth it not worth paying attention to not worth listening to um you know and she may have done those things to stay relevant so more people get her book so you know maybe she started on the path of maybe maybe she did do it i don't know i really don't know they say she wasn't above making people think her seances were you know top notch or whatever the case was and like i said i have no way of knowing even the people talking about it have no way of knowing they're just going by what happened in history what they read and stuff like that as far as i know anyway so i don't I want anybody to discount hp bolovsky's work because of that they also say similar things about asta crowley how he got into opiates and he was just uh trying to do a bunch of sex things which i mean that is all on record um, of happening, but in the same sense, we don't know what happened because we weren't there. And Alistair Crowley put out a lot of books, you know, the book of the law, um, which says love is the law. Do what thou wilt will be the, the word of the law or something to that effect, you know. Love is the law. I mean, a guy who is trying to do all these different sexual things, who's apparently the beast, and I mean, they say his name beast came from his mother and he held it his whole life. I mean, that kind of tells you a little bit of the fucking relationship he had with his parents and how that may have came about. So if he wasn't able to get rid of some of that programming while doing his magic, may have came out a little fucked up and shit like that. Now, I haven't studied a biography of Alistair Crowley, but I have read multiple, multiple of his books. And I think they're top notch, even the ones that can get into some kind of dark stuff. Um, you got to take it for what it is and use what you can use out of there because just because someone's calling on dark forces and all that you know if you're reading about that well you can still use similar processes to call on light forces you know the way he goes into his practice okay minus maybe some of the offerings and some of the other things he's done but you can still use that information to do just the same different polarity because good and bad are just the same just different extremes so you know that's why i don't ever say discount anybody's work over one thing a lot of people won't even look into alistair crowley who are in new age stuff because of they think he because he is so-called said he was the antichrist but what he meant by antichrist was that he was going to bring um balance to the world through destroying the christian religion and not in the way of i'm gonna bring back the devil and i'm gonna fucking do this but anyways so i might have more to say about this i'm gonna go to a song but for the most part i'm gonna this isn't live right now it is recordings because uh they deleted a bunch of my shit and i want to protect it i know if i put recordings on there um it's different audio added to their audio and they can't really delete it so anyways i'm gonna do a little more trial and error but yeah i'll be back about a few more things um right after this song
one to blame Thinking his way is not something that we both fought for Living this way is something that we never did But I don't think that would change Cause we're stuck in a world What's up, ladies and gentlemen? All right, so this is actually live now, um, and I hope it doesn't get removed, but it's far from the beginning, so that was kind of the point. Anyways, that being said, so what I was trying to get at and what I was trying to tell you is that I'm going to be playing um, uh, a show, History of the Occult. It was on the High Percentage Magic channel, so I hope he doesn't get pissed off that I'm playing it here, but I'm plugging his channel and telling you guys to check it out, especially his Egregore Servitor shit. He's got a lot of different content on there. He goes through a lot of really good books. Every book he's got on there, I fucking read, and I have. So if you see any of those books and you want them, yeah, after you check out High Percentage Magic's channel, um, hit me up. Um, likewise, hit me up if you want to be on the show. Hit me up if you are a musician and you want your music played on the show. Just hit me up. Anything you want. The sky's the limit, you know. Uh, if you're listening to this and, you know, you kind of like it or you're just listening it because you think it's helping. I don't care why you listen to it. Thank you for listening it, by the way. But, yeah, if you want to put your voice on the, on the air, if you want to talk about what you've manifested, if you want to talk about your practice, your sex, your um, spirituality, uh, whatever you got, whatever you want. If you got music about spirituality, if you just got music in general, you know. I don't care if it's rap. I don't care if it's country. I don't care if it's whatever. You know, I'm depolarized. One of the things I do... I can do is when I listen to a song, I can literally feel the emotion of, of, of the, the person singing. You know, I can tell if they're legit or not legit. That's why I can listen to stupid pop music. Um, you know, I like, I'm not going to lie there, Katy Perry and Taylor Swift are not like huge on my fucking playlist and what I want to listen to. But there are certain songs that they make that I can feel the emotion and the attention in it. And that being said, it, it gets to me. Um, maybe it's the whole empath crap I talked about there, being able to feel energy and I can feel it through their songs songs are like a million times more powerful than an affirmation you know it's like a spell you got words in there you got emotion in there you got music in there you know and if you add the dancing to it and sex to it and shit like that oh my god you do some powerful stuff with music so yeah anyways anybody wants their songs played on here hit me up um, just a warning though, um, because I'm trying to step up my game, especially with my recordings and shit like that, I wanted to make that this recording as uh, as good as I possibly could with the sound so that people don't mind listening to it. Um, but um some ads came up sometimes the um sometimes the uh the wi-fi wasn't there for the signal and it dropped so i'm gonna do my best to to listen along with it um write down notes um that i channel from you know my higher self or whatever um as it goes along and anytime i see there's going to be a gap or a commercial starting i may pause it and play a song and try to fast forward through it um but if i'm not here because i have to deal with my daughter here in the background um that that's that'll be why if you go through a little bit of dead air and shit like that so i'll do my best to avoid the dead air but um yeah so um the reason i'm playing this also is because every one of these topics they get into on this show on this history of the cult are worth a study on their own. You know, they start off with uh, Alistair Crowley, which I think I skipped the part because he showed his magical powers on display. I think everybody who's looked at any of this stuff have seen that video where he goes down to his knees and he makes a guy before in front of him go down, some random guy fall to his knees. But, you know, it hits on uh, Egyptians and Babylonians and then it goes to... Um, Isaac Newton, and then it goes to Pythagoras, um, and, and it just keeps going from there to eventually the Blavatsky and shit like that. Every one of these sections has a whole, a whole area that would would be well serve you to study on its own. So because it's got all jam packed in here, the goal of me putting this out here is for you guys to to listen to hear all these different things how the media portrays it you know some of these people are, are probably magical practitioners but some of the things they say are probably because you know they are they're told to say specific things and weren't allowed to say other specific things about it i don't know 
I can't. Uh, that's just uh, me. Um, me assuming that because I know some of the people, some of the uh, the people talking on here, um, and their perception is a lot different than some of their works. So, point is though, um, Toth, Thoth. Okay, a long time ago, I was very into Thoth, and I still am. And I I've done invocations of Thoth to ask him for his knowledge and help me out. And you know, at first nothing came to me, and now. I have this great connection where I get all this information about anything I decide to focus on. Um, so I know there's power in that and they go into that. And, you know, when they start talking about how many witches got burned, I don't know if that's the real number, the fake number. I know um, there's been some controversy around that. But like I said, you can study that alone and that'll take you probably a year to get all the information and then write a book about if you wanted to. Point is, every one of these things on here is worth studying on your own, getting your own for information about and following up on and to make sure it's accurate or not. Don't think because I'm putting this on here that everything these people say word for word is my belief because it is not. Like I already said about H.P. Vlatsky. I don't know if she did the things they did, but I just feel like because Aleister Crowley, um, you know, if you're thinking on terms of good or bad, which I don't, but the things that are on record about him are probably worse than what H.P. Vlatsky did depending on how you think. And, you know, she probably people are gonna look worse on her because she's a woman or whatever the case was. So I don't like I don't like putting stuff out there like that. But unfortunately, I'd have to pause or mute the whole time just so you didn't hear that specific part. And you know, I don't believe in also hiding the facts. You know, Birch talks about how there's been dianic sects of uh, witchcraft that whenever came to Aradia, the gospel the book of the witches there, gospel of the witches, um, they stopped the fact both, uh, it says both men and women, you know, being naked in your rights and shit like that, both men and women play the game of Benevento, all that shit. Um, but they take the men out and say just women and anybody that reads that and doesn't go any deeper and actually looks into the real source being that, you know, the man who wrote that is in fact a man or got that information out was a man. Um, but anyways, so I don't believe in covering up shit. Um, I want you to have all the information because once again, if I cover something up, then it's going to be like, well, Corey covered that up. What else is he doing? And people are just not going to listen to my information. So anyways, I'm going to go to it because I need to help my wife with the baby. Um, but I'm going to try to minimize the bullshit, the ads that popped up uh, whenever I was playing the recording, um, the dead air from the fucking shitty Wi-Fi signal and so on and so forth. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And I uh, will be back on after to talk about that invocation I did to Toth um, and how you can go about doing it yourself and a few other things. So anyways, uh, like I said, I hope you enjoy. Uh, yeah, enjoy the show. Whether they can divine them and see them far away or whether they can actually influence things far away. Magic is both an art and a science. Certain things cause certain effects to happen Um at the same time, they have to be done with a certain intention and perhaps a certain flair in order to work. Was Crowley a master of 20th century occult magic, as some have claimed? His beliefs were nothing new. Crowley took his lead from the Egyptians, early occultists who believed that spells could heal the sick and make crops grow. Some things that seem supernatural can often become accepted fact. Sir Isaac Newton believed that an invisible force called gravity that held planets in orbit around the sun, created action at a distance. Newton hesitated to share his groundbreaking theory of gravity for fear that it would be branded as magic. Science nowadays really is touching against ideas dealing with where magic and spirituality and religion um, intersect. And they're both ways of trying to find out about how the world works. The occult means secret or hidden and its early masters were regarded as true magicians. But they were also the first scientists. Their discoveries in the occult arts of astrology and alchemy gave birth to modern scientific disciplines. You go back to ancient times, there was no science. So the magicians and the alchemists and the proto-mathematicians, they were doing science, but they were also doing literature and philosophy and cosmology and religion, and there was no sorting out of those uh, things. Since the birth of what we would call modern science, science and the occult have sort of uh, separated. 
the paths. Many still view the occult with suspicion, but modern science is often working on the edge of the supernatural, trying to solve mysteries that confronted the first magicians. Serious physicists are contemplating time travel. Serious physicists are contemplating parallel universes. Serious physicists are trying to understand the 11 dimensions of the string theory. And when you get into those realms, you start to look to myth and uh, sort of magical thinking and almost surreal thinking as a way to even talk about those things. Were the early occult masters keepers of secrets that modern science is only beginning to rediscover? The trail of the occult begins in Egypt 5,000 years ago. Just before the rise of Egypt's great pharaohs, hieroglyphics or pictographs were invented. Egyptians used them to document their history and religion and to practice complex systems of astronomy, astrology, and geometry. They believed their powerful knowledge came from the god Thoth. Thoth, or Tehuti, was the Egyptian god of magic. And more than just the god of magic, he was the god of writing, of astronomy, of mathematics, and science. He invented language, invented writing. Only priests with special training were allowed access to Thoth's sacred knowledge. Imhotep, builder of the first pyramid, was one of the chosen. Thoth was considered to be the one who gave us writing and numbers and the um, arts of self-cultivation through works of consciousness. Some people thought he was a person who was then deified through his accomplishments. Other people feel that this has been a mythical entity from the beginning. Legends held that a book of magic written by Thoth contained the secrets of the gods. The book of Thoth was actually considered to be um, in the astral plane. Not a physical thing, but something that you had to actually travel in consciousness to arrive at. And so uh, this is probably one of those very old incidences of channeling where an individual would get into a special state of mind, contact the thought energy wherever it was to be found, and then be tutored by this uh, multilingual, multi-code kind of consciousness if you were to describe the book of thoth you could also you know look at, at a building like the pyramid or the sphinx and say that the teachings contained therein are pages within the book of thoth so all measurement all words all concepts are part of the book of thoth but no book of thoth has ever been found the god is said to have buried it beneath the nile protected its secrets with a deadly curse. Modern archaeologists eventually discovered that the Babylonians had created much of the knowledge Egyptians credited to Thoth. As early as 4000 BC, they were the first to measure planetary movements. They invented the abacus, the first sequential numeric system, and some of the earliest forms of astrology and astronomy. This information spread to Egypt and helped launch one of history's greatest cultures, like the Egyptians, the Babylonians regarded their knowledge as divine. Every temple was an observatory. It was actually an astronomical uh, site for watching the planets. The whole concept of divining means trying to understand the will of the gods. And in order to understand the will of the gods, you have to have something to read about them, something that you see they're doing. The Babylonians used one of the occult's oldest arts to understand their world, divination, or accessing the supernatural. The movements of the planets through the heavens used to be considered the footprints of the gods and goddesses. And when they would catch up with each other and have interactions, or one would go retrograde and then go forward again, these things were all uh, understood to affect the world. It began in the Stone Age, when shamans invoked the spirits to ensure the success of the hunt. Certain people who were uh, distinguishable by early man as having sort of mystical experiences, and these would be the religious representatives of the clan, these people would have been communicating in, in ways of imagination to kind of talk to the gods or talk to the spirits or... Um, uh, affect certain things that would happen. In Egypt, divination developed into a sophisticated system of rituals and ceremonies designed to contact the gods who ruled their world. 
You, of course, you were trying to influence uh, things like your success in business or the crops. The Egyptians used rituals. They used incantations. They used the symbols to convey the, all of those things. The pharaoh himself was the head of their religion, so that he was probably the chief practitioner of both their religion and their magic. Much of what is called ceremonial magic, the casting of spells, the use of magic words and incantations, came from the Egyptians. When Phoenician traders spread this knowledge throughout the Mediterranean world, magic became practical. They codified an alphabet that would line up the sounds of speech, the number cannon, and the zodiacal signs, planets, and uh, features in the heavens so that you could, with this alphabet, spell sacred words. You could also count and, and figure and calculate, and you could also do astronomy. The sacred origins of these disciplines were gradually forgotten. In 1212 BC, Ramses II, the last great pharaoh of Egypt, died. Invading armies conquered the land of the Nile. Its occult secrets were lost, but not forever. We've always loved horror. It's just that horror hasn't always loved us. Black people play a particular role in horror films. First we weren't in it. We were played by white people. Yeah. We went from maids to pimps and hoes. If there was somebody black, they would be the first to die. <laughs> After the decline of Egypt's extraordinary culture, another civilization rose, Greece in the 6th century BC. It was aided by one of the most probing minds in history, Pythagoras. Our alphabet, the buildings that surround us, even the music we hear, owes a debt to this brilliant philosopher. In his pursuit of wisdom, Pythagoras traveled broadly, searching for lost occult knowledge. He found it in the mystery schools scattered throughout many different cultures. Pythagoras synthesized the elements of these teachings into a new discipline, philosophy. Its foundation, numbers. He believed that mathematics and philosophy and an understanding of the divine all went together. We can't say he originated anything, but he condensed and boiled down the knowledge of the world and then brought it to a practical uh, application. Pythagoras identified numbers as the most fundamental elements of creation. As we look at science in this day and age, we're finding that the whole world is filled with these mathematical constants. You've got pi, you've got the speed of light, you've got you know, the force of gravitation. So the idea that numbers describe the world seems to be the case. In 518 BC, Pythagoras opened a school in the Croton region of southern Italy. His carefully selected disciples were called Mathematicoi. Their initiation was rigorous. Three introductory years, followed by five years of absolute silence, then five more of training. Only then were students ready to learn the most sacred mysteries of numbers. He wanted to produce philosophers like himself, so you had to be very circumspect, you had to be very self-controlled to be able to even be in his school. Pythagoras turned the numbering system of the Babylonians into a sacred science. They believed that number was like God, and to, me, to connect with this was to be talking to God, and so from that arises a, a whole lot of symbolism that later becomes numerology, Kabbalah, things like that. Pythagoras discovered that the mystery schools shared the belief that all of creation was at one with God. He did a huge amount uh, of explaining sacred mathematics by showing how the one splits and becomes two, the two finds a synthesis and becomes three, the three breaks open and becomes the 10,000 things. And that same story you read in the I Ching, you read in other metaphysical uh, ancient documents, because everybody was trying to understand how do we get number out of all. Many credit Pythagoras and his school with the development of numerology and the efficient Greek alphabet eventually adopted by much of Western culture. Pythagoras also applied numbers to decode music, which Greeks regarded as the language of the gods. 
He invented the monochord, which defined the numerical ratios of the musical scale. Pythagoras believed he had solved the mysteries of the universe. But there was also this idea that there was a music of the spheres, that the heavens itself was playing a sort of orchestral piece. The planets themselves stack up around the sun at harmonic intervals. White light breaks out into color at harmonic intervals. Sound is also harmonically uh, you know, the, the, the harmonic sequence that comes out of any given note, those nodes of overtones are all governed by the same mathematics. So it was Pythagoras who articulated harmonic math to the West. Ultimately, the exclusivity of Pythagoras' school caused its downfall. In 508 BC, the school was burned to the ground. There was a point at which his schools were attacked and destroyed, and some of his followers killed. Pythagoras himself left and went off into the countryside and died, and no one really knows what happened. Some people think that he committed suicide, but it's, it's a mystery. No one's really sure. The society was hounded into extinction. Generations of later Greeks built upon Pythagoras' philosophy, and Aristotle turned it into science. But then came Christianity, and for the next thousand years, religion cast a long shadow over science and the occult. During the first 15 centuries of Christianity, occult knowledge was driven underground. When the Judeo-Christian consolidation of Western spirituality became the enforced model, magic was really moved way off to the sidelines and became a, a dark and forbidden subject. Priests were the intermediaries between people and the divine. Christianity also wielded unparalleled political influence. The church had uh, a, developed a hierarchy. It had developed the idea that the uh, Pope uh, took his uh, word from God and then passed that down to the rest. And the church had also cemented itself uh, with certain monarchs. The church closely guarded its exclusive access to divine authority. Like every other in-crowd group, if everybody can do it, then you can't claim that your guys are you know, special. For centuries, Western Europe lived largely under church control. In the Middle Ages, magic became a rebellious act perpetrated almost as an anti-Christian or an anti-authoritarian type of behavior. The church singled out occultists, condemning them because they believed that an individual could have direct access to God. They took the whole concept of of uh, church hierarchy, priests, the church itself as a place of worship and said, no, you don't need any of this stuff. What you need is to work on discovering within yourself that divine spark. But in the 14th century, the occult would rise again. Ironically, the church's holy war, the Crusades, was in part responsible. Monasteries to the east on the border of the Muslim and preserved many of the ancient Greek and occult texts, studying them as curiosities. Returning crusaders brought a number of these documents back to Europe with them. This learning started to trickle back, and little things were found in monasteries, a bit of scripture here, a bit of text there. Uh, and so the rumors were around that there had been greater learning in the past. This rediscovery fueled an extraordinary rebirth of culture. Well, this was the point people began to realize, oh, there... Hey, kids, remember, everything you're about to learn is free! Stop with the screaming! I've only shrunk the dog and Where are we? Should we 
say, when are we? No, you shouldn't. Who talks like that? wisdom amongst the ancients. You have uh, a new reverence for uh, Egyptian and Greek and Roman uh, and Hebraic tradition because people are looking for uh, really empowering knowledge and looking to understand the secrets of the ancients. Art and science swept through Western Europe in the 1400s as it ushered in the Renaissance. Leading the movement into new ways of looking at old knowledge was the German physician Paracelsus. Born in Germany in 1493, Paracelsus trained in traditional medicine but also studied alchemy. Ultimately, forced out of school for challenging the status quo, he embarked on a nomadic life supporting himself with astrology readings. In his far-flung travels, he sought knowledge from any source he could find. Paracelsus went around Europe and uh, talked to barbers, talked to witches, talked to midwives, talked to, you know, the village healer, oh my, and well. gathered together from everywhere what hey, worked. And this was his huge uh, final stance, is I use what works. He rejected outworn theories, ventured beyond accepted boundaries. His pioneering experiments with minerals and chemicals laid the foundation for modern medicine. It was just the beginning of a scientific revolution. The next century would herald the discovery of an occult text that went against more than tradition. It was a threat to the power of the church. The Renaissance brought about a new spirit of learning, and academies sprung up throughout Europe. In the 15th century, Marsilio Ficino founded one of Italy's most progressive. With the support of his patron, Cosimo Medici, Facino acquired and translated a collection of documents reputedly authored by a mysterious Egyptian magician named Hermes Trismegistus. An emissary from the uh, Orthodox Church brought a cache of documents, and Facino found, I, I think it was 12 books supposedly written by Hermes. They um, weren't necessarily all written as one book, but they, got, they were gathered together once these translations were made. The documents which became known as the Hermetically old pre having come from Egypt. <laughs> Scholars would determine that the man Hermes Trismegistus never existed. What Ficino was translating was a compendium of Greek lore about how an individual could cultivate themselves and become enlightened. Raising of a given individual's consciousness until they are like the gods. The books were set up as a series of dialogues between the god Hermes and others who conveyed the secrets of the universe. One of the documents was a short piece called the Emerald Tablet, which became the Bible of the Renaissance occultists. On this tablet, it was said, I, these are all legends, uh, that there were uh, 12 or 13 lines, and these lines started with as above, so below. Um, this was the great idea of the pattern of the universe, the pattern of the stars, and the, the great universe is repeated as well on the earth. The Hermeticum restated the teaching of the early mystery schools that human beings possessed a divine nature. So this is really the goal of hermetic initiation and any other kind of initiation would be to transcend our mortality and put us back into our ultimate state as spiritual uh, peers. The Hermeticum dazzled Renaissance scholars and occultism was reborn. Could the idea that human beings shared a direct link to God undermine the authority of the church? The discovery of the Hermeticum during the Renaissance created a new generation of occultists. They sought to combine religion with science and magic, a dangerous undertaking in a society ruled by Christianity. John Dee would risk his life to study its teachings. John Dee was a giant. John Dee was the embodiment of the ideal of an enlightened being who had the uh, spiritual 
understanding of his role and mission in life and who was gifted with, you know, superior intelligence. But like Pythagoras, he would pay a heavy price for daring to seek out the wisdom of the gods. The ultimate Renaissance man, Dee followed in the footsteps of Paracelsus, using experimentation to become a gifted scientist, an inventor, a mathematician, a brilliant cryptographer, and a pioneer in the field of navigation. But he was also an occultist, he was a sorcerer, he was an astrologer, he was in fact Queen Elizabeth's personal court astrologer. And in that sense, his interests were all very much in keeping with the thinking of the time. There wasn't a distinction made between magic and science, and he was pursuing an understanding of the world around him. When Queen Elizabeth rose to the throne of England in 1558, she installed Dee as court astrologer. But his influence reached far beyond his position. England's famous magician was also a spy for the Queen. He was involved with political intrigue. He was a uh, trusted ally of, of the uh, Queen, but he was also working behind the scenes throughout Europe to helped to lower the power of the church and to substitute Protestant power in its stead. With Dee's guidance, Queen Elizabeth officially legitimized the most significant occult science of the Renaissance, alchemy. Alchemists had two goals, to heal illness and to turn base metal into gold. They believed success could be achieved by finding the Philosopher's Stone a mystical agent that would also produce a higher level of consciousness in the alchemist. That was really an approach to trying to understand the way the physical world works, and alchemy as a practice you know, was the forefather of modern chemistry. Alchemy had existed since the early Egyptians, but in the hands of the Renaissance scientists, it reached new heights. Everything that we know and do today in our modern science was... Uh, developed by the alchemists. Laboratory techniques were part of the alchemical tradition. The observation of results, the scientific method, is, is a child of alchemy. Alchemists were on the leading edge of science. They discovered phosphorus, zinc, the distillation of alcohol, the germ nature of diseases. They were the first to understand how blood circulates in the body. The church viewed their unorthodox experiments and scientific breakthroughs with growing suspicion. We are speeding up what nature does. We're speeding up the rate at which the metals evolve. We're speeding up the rate at which medicines are combined and, and raise consciousness. And Okay, I want you to imagine for a second everything you buy for your house. Soap, shampoo, cleaners, those chocolate chip cookies you love. How much do you think you spend on all of that per year? On average, $6,000. And if you want the healthy natural stuff, make that 8000 The thing is, these products don't actually... I am very sorry about all this bullshit, how it keeps coming on and the ads. I should have been very careful. Fortunately, I was taking care of my daughter at the same time as playing this, but I'm very sorry. I hope you guys stick with it uh, through the ads and the shitty Wi-Fi connection and all that. But thank you, I appreciate it. So I called my friend Mike to help me. He used to run roller disco parties, but he's also very smart. And came up with a brilliant idea. What if we didn't use retailers? And we didn't use distributors? So anyways, um, like I said, as soon as this is done, um, I'm going to get into uh, about Toth and my invocation of Toth and how, you know, I invocated uh, the teachings and Hecate to be like a deity to me and I do the same thing with Toth, you know, and with uh, Toth, you, know, you would do it like on a Wednesday uh, with Mercury, Mercury being air, your thoughts and all that uh, for healing too, would be that as well, um, how healing and, um, you know, uh, information is all kind of connected, um, that'll be an episode all on its own, but, um, yeah, you want to, um, if you want to learn uh, magic, if you want to get good intuition, then uh, Toth is, uh, is the guy to see. And once again, um, there's a lot of bad shit in the, of the Babylonians in the Bible and shit like that. And I'm not there, I wasn't there, so I can't really say exactly why that is. And I don't judge, but I have a feeling because the Babylonians, they say the Babylonians knew this shit before the Egyptians did. And to me, that could be why. 
um, you know, God was so against the Babylonians because whoever wrote the Bible wanted you to think the Babylonians were bad and that magic's bad and this and that and the other thing. And that's just my interpretation because I don't have the facts and I wasn't there. There's no way for me to know if that was in fact true or false. But knowing what I know about the Christian faith and all that, it's very likely that that could be true. Shalom, my name is Ol, which is the Hebrew word for light. If you already knew this, the church felt that you can't be speeding up God's creation without recourse to demons. Despite his work in alchemy, Dee's true occult passion lay in divination. He believed that he could apply scientific methods to communicate with supernatural beings. Dee's obsession with contacting the angels would have disastrous consequences. This art of manipulating objects like bones, tea leaves, and tarot cards had arrived from the Muslim East in the 14th century and become a popular method of fortune telling. But Dee used a divination method known as scrying. Dee relied on looking into a crystal ball that would reflect back supernatural information. Scrying is a long time old technique, scrying into glasses, mirrors, bodies of water, anything that would have a reflective surface, uh, and see if you could see not just the material things, but the spiritual things standing behind. These efforts were unsuccessful until one day a young man named Edward Kelly appeared at his door. Kelly seemed to have the talent to see into the shadow world. Their system involved Edward Kelly looking into a amethyst crystal and describing what he saw and John Dee would then record these uh, communications. Kelly began receiving messages from the angels. They spoke in a language he called Enochian from the lost biblical book of Enoch. These transmissions are early examples of what new age followers now call channeling. What Dee and Kelly brought forth was completely new. It, it was not based on tradition. He appeared to be speaking a new language. The Enochian language does appear to have a coherent vocabulary and syntax, and this doesn't seem like the sort of thing that Kelly, who was not a particularly educated or schooled person, could have just invented. He couldn't have faked something like that. John Dee and Kelly embarked on a tour of Europe to share their discoveries, just as the Inquisition launched another crackdown against heretics. All you needed was a slight change in political or religious circumstance, and something that was considered exceptionally wonderful would then be considered demonic and scary. Dee returned home to England to find that a mob had destroyed his irreplaceable library and scientific and occult instruments. Dee had fallen out of favor with the court. The man who began dating Plato, in fact, and more than four executed for witchcraft. Occult ideas became embedded in the traditions of secret societies, such as the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians. They were tending to do them uh, passed on among secret brotherhoods and organizations because these are very powerful and dangerous ideas, dangerous to status quo, dangerous to institutionalized religion. So there's a an element of underground secrecy associated with some of these themes. These havens of safety began to flourish across Europe. Secret societies were instrumental in the new age of enlightenment that swept through Europe in the 1700s and even helped in the founding of American democracy. Participation in these organizations had fallen dramatically by the mid-1800s as they became more civic-minded and less interested in the occult. So what would cause a resurgence in the occult? In rural New York, two unlikely sisters would inspire a national obsession with the occult. Magic would once again capture imaginations. On March 31st, 1848, sisters Leah and Margaret Fox publicly declared that they had contacted spirits from beyond the grave. An American fascination for communicating with the dead occurred almost overnight. The Fox sisters used a technique called a seance which quickly became one of America's most popular pastimes. 
people gathered in a darkened room while a medium tried to make contact with the spirit world. There would be tambourines and other bells that would sound, and the medium would actually be able to exude you know, ectoplasm from their nostrils or their mouth, and it was this sort of spiritual substance that allowed the spirits of the dead to manifest and make and appear. And in other cases, the medium would simply become a conduit or a channel through which the, the deceased were able to speak. Many who practice spiritualism believed it would lead to scientific proof of the existence and immortality of the soul. And they gained an iconic champion when the Russian-born Madame Blavatsky arrived in New York at the height of spiritualism's popularity. She soon became the self-proclaimed decoder of ancient occult secrets. She grew up in a wonderful occult library that her father had established. She could see the connections between different cultures, spiritual teachings, and she was attempting to correct the errors of Christianity by bringing in mysticism and spirituality from other cultures. Born in the Ukraine in 1831 to a lower-ranking nobleman, Blavatsky was married early, but she abandoned her husband to spend 10 years traveling the world. She claimed to have studied with mystical adepts in India and Tibet. The exotic cigar-smoking medium became a sensation in the occult circles. She just wouldn't accept limits. She was one of the most educated person anybody who met her had ever met. And they couldn't understand, how could this powerful intellect be in this female body, just chewing up the landscape and producing this tremendous inspiration? Blavatsky's seances were the talk of New York. Mysterious letters would appear, written by spiritual leaders she called the Great White Brotherhood. Blavatsky was not above of taking advantage of the popularity of seances to push her own cause, and she used the seances to in a very spectacular effect to materialize letters written by these um, ascended masters as instructions being passed down to her. The Brotherhood dictated to her the books that became the foundation of a new science of mysticism, Theosophy. Blavatsky wrote uh, essentially two gigantic uh, collections, Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine, which purported to be the teachings, the secret teachings of this kind of Eastern uh, Brotherhood, the mystery schools of initiation. And she totally altered the spiritual landscape of Western civilization by introducing those concepts. She was very much a pioneer in bringing ideas of Eastern esotericism into the West. She focused on the similarities between Christianity and Hinduism and Buddhism and other spiritual traditions, arguing that there is, in fact, a tradition that underlies all spiritual faiths in the world. Blavatsky regarded her work as spiritual science and made connections between recent scientific advancements and occult beliefs. Blavatsky promoted the ancient Eastern mystical view that the essential nature of the world was not matter, but energy, which foreshadowed the discoveries of modern physics. Blavatsky also revived the Eastern beliefs in reincarnation and karma, Quickly acquiring a cult following, she launched the Theosophy Society. The term Theosophy, which Blavatsky coined, really comes from two words that are of Greek origin. One is Theos, which means God, and Sophia, which means wisdom. So the Theosophical Society was teaching divine or sacred wisdom. The Theosophical Society spread internationally and still exists in many countries. Blavatsky was hailed by her followers as the mother of the new age. But for all of Blavatsky's charisma, she soon fell victim to her own success. And at the time that she was becoming famous, this business of spiritualism and channeling and especially uh, seances where you'd call up your dead ancestors, that was going all over the Western world, and she felt like that was charlatanism. So she wanted to represent an, a model that stepped outside of that and spoke to the verities, the truths, the larger things. But unfortunately, in the end, she got reduced down to the very things she was trying to fight. 
In 1885, Blavatsky was investigated by London's Society for Psychical Research. It concluded that her seances were rigged. Writings didn't magically come from beyond the grave. There was a spring-loaded device in the bedroom above her chamber that allowed, it some, that allowed someone to put a letter into this device and have it drop down between the floorboards and materialize in her hands. Though many devoted followers refused to abandon Theosophy, Blavatsky was now tainted with fraud. She died soon afterwards. Her followers established a new headquarters in India where Theosophy thrived. A young protege, Krishnamurti, was identified as a reincarnated master and groomed to lead the Theosophy Society into the 20th century. Blavatsky's synthesis of Eastern and Western spirituality broke new ground in occultism. A man described by newspapers as the most wickedest man alive claimed he had penetrated even deeper into mysteries. Born in 1875, Aleister Crowley was raised in a strict religious household. His mother nicknamed him the Beast from the Book of Revelation. It was a title he embraced his entire life. He identified himself as the Antichrist, as the uh, force that would take away this terrible Christian program which had so warped his childhood. Crowley began studying the occult as a member of the Golden Dawn. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was the secret society par excellence of the Victorian age in England. It brought together, again, the knowledge that was available at that point in time. So you had tarot, and you had Kabbalah, and you had John Dee's angelic magic and Rosicrucian traditions all being melded together under a single system. The Golden Dawn attracted many of the London intelligentsia. Crowley, though, ultimately broke away from the group. He would find his own system of belief after a trip to Egypt where his wife received a mystical signal that told him to prepare himself for a message from the gods. Heeding the call, he began spontaneously writing a book he called the Book of the Law. This book an announces a new law for mankind. And, in fact... It tells us that we are very emboldened and, and brightened spiritual entity. That in fact, you know, we are a, as the gods. The Book of the Law was another synthesis of Eastern and Western spirituality. Crowley called his new system the Lima. It incorporated principles of magic that he said he had learned from ancient Egyptian and other occult sources. He became a self-proclaimed master of action at a distance focusing the power of his intention or will to create desired effects. Aleister Crowley defined magic as the art and science of causing change to occur in conformity with the will. And his whole approach is basically to empower the practitioner to make their intentions happen, to materialize what they want to have happen in the world. Thalema's fundamental law was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. While this may have meant pursuing a higher path for some, for others, it excused every variety of deviant behavior. Some critics claim that Crowley himself was one of its worst offenders. Crowley was practicing sexuality as a spiritual path. He reduced a great deal of symbolic teachings to their essence, which is essentially the duality or the polarity between male and female. And he uh, experimented greatly within, within that sphere to understand what, it, what mysteries were contained within the sexual act. Crowley went on to start his own secret society, the Ordo Templi Orientis, and wrote numerous books about meditation and ceremonial magic. He also helped reinterpret Tarot for the 20th century. The Tarot is a pictorial representation of occult teachings. It's a uh, method of going within and contacting archetypal levels within oneself, spiritual levels, and entering meditative state in which intuition is heightened and maybe even, you know, where you can see certain patterns developing because you're in the right state of mind. While popularized by Italian noblemen in the 1300s as playing cards, 
Some say Tarot's origins date to ancient Egypt. Over time, they acquired occult significance. Crowley developed a deck of his own called the Book of Thoth, based on the Egyptian magic he had studied. A popular divination tool today, Tarot is said to reveal information about the seeker and the questions about his future. Everything that's related in one moment of time is all connected. So if two people come together around a question and they're manipulating an oracular tool like this, but if that manipulation is intended to serve the need and the feeling, then it will make a mirroring reflection of the energy that's produced between the two people. Crowley's writings, like Madame Blavatsky's, were heralded as 40,000 people would be house and die. Like other occultists before him, Crowley attempted to learn the secrets of the gods, only to be discredited and condemned by society. I think that in the cases of these great thinkers in history that we see ultimately being persecuted for their beliefs, what's happening there is that these people are very forward-thinking and they challenge our pride in 1947 self-awareness. Millions of young people who rejected traditional religion to find their own direct route to God. By the 1980s, New Age ideas had become mainstream. Madame Blavatsky's writings became pivotal in reinterpreting occultism for modern audiences, and even Aleister Crowley's reputation was somewhat restored. There was this boom in occult interest that resulted in Crowley being almost a pop culture icon. The Beatles put Aleister Crowley on the cover of Sgt. Pepper. You have musicians like David Bowie and um, Jimmy Page becoming very interested in Crowley. He experienced a renaissance, as it were, in the 60s and 70s and has been a very popular figure ever since. Occult belief systems are now embraced by millions of New Age followers who pick and choose from their wide array of concepts to fashion their own individual brand of spirituality. Yet the occult is still often regarded with suspicion. Many of those who practice occultism describe it as a modern mystical quest. The mystical quest is the process by which a limited, time-space-bound human being can transcend their background and history and come into this divinized or macrocosmic consciousness. And that is the process of becoming immortal, you know, leaving this physical flesh behind and being successively identified with larger and larger realms of reality. The holistic philosophy of New Age beliefs continues to grow in popularity. We're surrounded by material wealth and technology, and we feel like we've lost something. We've lost that connectedness. We've lost the understanding of our human roots. And a lot of the interest in New Age ideas and a lot of the look back to ancient ideas uh, stems from that desire to reconnect with that history and to make us feel more whole, more spiritual, more connected, more aware of the passion and meaning of life around us. But what began as occult magic has informed the world of science. There were attempts, legitimate attempts, to try to understand the way the world works. And there would there would not be astronomy today if it had not been for the ancient astrologers who studied the heavens. There would not be chemistry today if it weren't for the alchemists who did their thing as well. Some of the secrets that they thought they were working on were the secret of eternal life, um, the secret of being able to be um, uh, without disease, then the great secrets of transformation, let's say, of lead into gold, but that's like not the only one. Maybe one of the transformations is the human being into a godlike thing. Um, and, and, and it's a wonderful thing that uh, now we come around to uh, particle physics and people thinking that life is pure energy and that maybe there is a connection between those ideas that maybe the, the power to become godlike is in the uh, ability to transform yourself. Medicine and science have benefited from the input of occultism. And in the future... What we think of as magic may play a role in even greater discoveries. In our push to science, we're a culture of specialists, very focused on particular areas. So I think some of that holistic nature from the past is necessary to make the breakthroughs that we are currently not able to make in science. Beliefs can blind us.
whether they're religious beliefs or scientific beliefs. And the great thing about these occult sorts of experiments is that they keep us open to possibility. Despite the progress made by science, the modern world is still full of mysteries that may never be solved. It's the unknowable. It's the mystery. And that mystery is the center of the spiritual quest. But it's also the center of the scientific quest and the artistic quest. That is what we're here on Earth to do, is seek after that mystery. Like the first occultists, modern scientists will continue to search for ways to divine the mysteries of our world and the forces that have created them.
back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Ceremonial Witchcraft. And yeah, so how was that? I hope everybody enjoyed that. And I'm fucking sorry about all the bullshit stupid ads that popped up while I was trying to record that. It's funny. I tried to record it last night and not a single ad came on it. But yet my Wi-Fi kept dropping. Well, just randomly, you know, and maybe it wasn't, maybe it's because they were trying to put ads on there and nothing was popping up. I don't really know. I really can't tell you what happened. And then today, um, the fucking thing, the Wi-Fi didn't kick out once. Well, maybe once, but, uh, just fucking ads in there. And, you know, I tried to fucking find them when I got them, but the point was to record that so I can do two things at once, you know, help my daughter and, you know, get lunch ready and shit like that. And then fucking come on here when it was done play it and then you know leave this alone and go help out and gather my thoughts while i could listen to this and you know and talk to you guys about it but anyways so that's besides the point so um yeah so like i said this is uh this is this is something that was uh released uh, to the world to watch if they wanted to watch it basically um it's an occult view that doesn't do a lot of damage maybe to occults because when i watch that i get pumped up okay um I know I see things in there, I hear things in there that are, you know, skeptical and the way to describe certain things to me is just, it's not accurate, really. Um, talking about how the Book of Toth, there's no actual book for it, and it's in the astral, you know, and you have to channel the energy of Toth. And you know what, that, that probably, that's probably how it is for some people and all that. And But to me, it's not that, um, it's not that mystical, how they make it. They make it sound so fucking mystical, like... You know, you have to, hey, Toth, please come here and go with me. Anytime you ask him, please, you know, it's not going to work. Fuck, you gotta, you got to act like you already have it. But, yeah, the invocation I did to uh, Toth and is similar to the one I did for Hecate, you know. Uh, Hecate was a different day of the week and shit like that. And, you know, I had Hecate sigils put on, you know, black candles or purple candles and shit like that. Whereas, you know, Toth would be on a yellow or orange candle, depending on how you feel about him. You know, some people think the sun is fire, some people think the sun is air. To me, I go with air because helium or, um, um, not helium. But anyways, the sun is, is a gas ball, just like Jupiter, just like Saturn. They're all big fucking gas giants, but, um, so they all have correspondence to air. Um, Jupiter is water and air. Um, Saturn is air and earth and fire i think are three of the, it depends on where you look you know different people different sites different different opinions but saturn would be mostly believe it or not air and that's because it's a corporation to that now i always thought saturn was earth because everything had to go through saturn to the 3d and it is it's earth and air um and like i said mars is uh fire and air i want to say anyways i'm not gonna get into all that i have all that written down but it's what how you feel about this that's, that's gonna matter you know um you know if you like having mercury and the sun both in, in the air with saturn also there and then you have as earth you have venus there maybe you think about gaia being there because gaia you know is our earth and all that um and then in water you have jupiter and you have the moon and then over there in fire you only have mars well if you think oh maybe you have three in air and maybe you should put one over there well then you can put the sun over there and you're not going to have any bad shit happen to you because this way it's you know it's the eight planets right including our own and there's two in every fucking sign this way you know and this way you know you know you have the you have the earth our earth over there with uh, venus and our earth and then you have the sun over there and you know and the sun and the earth are kind of like the you know Anyways, I'm getting off topic. It all depends on how you look at it. Um, But the point is that that was kind of just to make a a, a metaphor for what I was trying to get at. And I don't even remember what the fuck I was trying to get at. Got a fucking killer headache today there. My my body has a headache uh, right now. Um, I don't have anything. Uh, I'm my soul. I'm my my essence. I'm I'm not this entity. I'm not this body. All right. Uh, To get really into it, I wouldn't even be Corey LeBlanc. I would be a different name that I'm not going to tell you. But anyways, um, to invoke, um, to invoke, um, Toth, Thoth, sorry, I always say Toth, but it's Thoth, um, that's where the word thought comes from, thought forms, all the spirits around us, I say spirits, if you change that sports, uh, thought for spirits, then you might not want to have these evil thoughts, because that means you're around evil spirits, <laughs> um, but, to invoke him, you would do it on a Wednesday, and you would do it in the in the um, hour of you know Mercury, because Mercury holds Caduceus, just like Archangel Archangel Raphael holds Caduceus, just like Thoth 
would hold the caduceus. Um, they're all probably the same entity and just different branches of that entity where Mercury is more like commerce, communication. Um, Archangel Ma Raphael would be your healing and Thoth would be your, your witchcraft info. And, uh, you know, you want information. You want wisdom. Well, he's going to give you knowledge. And with that knowledge, you have to put it into action, you know, with your fire from, from Mars over there. You have to put that into action. And then from with, with your action and your knowledge, you're going to get the wisdom. And you sell that wisdom to people by either telling them or putting it into practice and showing them or using it to help and benefit other people and yourself. Well, then that's how you're going to make a living and find your passion and your purpose and all that shit we've gone already over. It's just a different perspective, I guess. But that's uh, that's how you would do it. Now, am I going to tell you exactly what I said? Well, no, because this was personal for me. I had specific things I wanted to know, so I put those down there. But if you know anything about invocation, I mean, you would just start off your ritual. You make your fucking circle, Kabbalistic cross. When you're doing your lesser vanishing of the pentagram, you know, if you want to do one um, where you invoke um, air, you know, because the lesser banishing of the pentagram is to banish, you know, anything, those elements, thought forms, whatever's around you. It's to get rid of it. It's to purify that space. So doing um, the hexagram, um, of the pentagram I can't uh, there's a different um, the other one that I, I, I've done I do I don't always do but I have done um, it's the one I use when I do invoke elements and stuff like that now do your research on this specific part because different um, witchcraft ceremonial magics have different appearance uh, of different um, opinions on doing this but when you're doing your lesser banishing of the ritual you can invoke and or banish stuff um now, I don't want to say too much about that because some people say you shouldn't do that. And like I just said, that's not how I do it. But when that's, like if you're banishing, if you're having bad thoughts or whatever at night, you're going to do your lesser banishing of the, uh, the pentagram wall. Then all I'm trying to say is it depends on where you're going to start with your finger, especially on that element. You know, on the element of air, you're going to... You're doing your lesser banishing of the pentagram, okay? You have the four pentagrams all around you. You have the one for air, fire, earth, and water. And within those pentagrams, okay, you are doing a fucking pentagram that has five points. So within the first one, let's say you start with air, right? You're just going around clockwise this time, not counterclockwise for the banishing. You are doing an invoking banishing pentagram, okay? I know I'm getting kind of confusing, so I guess I'm going to get into it even though I didn't want to. Um, so you're going around clockwise, which is the invoking version of the lesser banishing of the pentagram. So therefore, whenever you start on your point, it doesn't matter, I'm not talking about, you're going to the air quarter because there's an element there, there's an elemental there, and there's a watcher there, basically, okay? And you can say that watcher is Archangel Gabriel, or sorry, Raphael, Gabriel would be the water one, or not, doesn't matter, I'm not going to get into that part, I already didn't want to get into this, okay? But, so within that one air element, and this is why I didn't want to get into it because it's confusing. But within that one air element, you are doing a pentagram. And within that air element, within that pentagram you're tracing in the air, in that quarter, you have the four elements and the fifth of spirit that you're drawing. So within the actual sides, you know, east being air, north, south being a uh, fucking fire, South is fire. How funny is that, eh? <laughs> um, west is water and north is earth, okay? Within those quarters, you're doing a pentagram. And then, so if you are going to invoke or banish the element of air, then what I do is I would start at an opposite point of going to the air part of the one you're tracing. So you're tracing. It's very hard to do this with just the sound of my voice. So if I keep being redundant and repetitive, this is why. So when you're tracing that, the top point of the star, of the pentagram, is spirit. So don't think that's air. Do not go up there. And the best way to know is the opposite sides, okay? So if you, whenever you, okay, so you have your star, and the top point is spirit. So then you have four of the points. And they're both like an X across from each other. So if you don't know which is which, well, air and water are opposites and fire and earth are opposites. So if you want to invoke air, the opposite of air is water. 
Now we can debate about that all I want, but the way I remember it is because air and water are the same, just different degrees. Because there's animals that live in the water, that breathe water, just like us animals, humans, we breathe air. Just like the other animals do that. We have animals that live in water, we have animals that live in air. Um, and does that mean there's animals that could live in fire and live in earth? Of course. Because there is animals that live in Earth. There is insects that live in the Earth. So the only one that we don't see is fire. And that's just because we don't see it. But it's still an element. So damn right there's some animals or insects or fucking whatever that can live in fire. Just like there's stuff that live in the spirit. Okay? Now that's some higher knowledge and shit I don't want to get into right now. But that's some channeled information that blew my fucking mind when I got into it. But anyways, besides that, the point I'm getting at is if... So if you're going to start, let's say um, you're in the ear, you want to do the east one. Okay, well, the top point is spirit. So then your next two points um, beside that, you know, the star comes down. It's got two at the top and then two at the bottom, right? That's the two top parts of the X, the two bottom parts of the X I'm talking about. So well, if you start at the, if you're at the bottom left corner going up to the top right corner, if you're choosing that to be... Um, water and air so you would have your finger in the water part and you're going up to the air that's how i invoke or banish the element of air and i would do this in every quarter because even within the elements of air even within the element of fire even within the element of water even within the element of earth even within the element of spirit um well spirit you don't touch you don't don't do a pentagram for spirit but even within those four elements there are, like in, in air, there's fire, there's water, there's earth. In fire, there's water, there's air, there's earth. In water, there's air, there's fire, there's earth. And in earth, well, we all know that air, fire, water equals earth. Okay, so therefore, it's the same for all the other elements. In my opinion, that's just my opinion. That's how I remember this. That's how I look at that. So if you're in banishing, you want to banish air out of your air element. You want to banish air out of your fire element. You want to banish air out of your water element. You want to banish air out of your earth element. This way, all parts of you, because you're made up from water, air, fire, and earth. So if you're having these terrible thoughts and you want to banish the terrible thoughts, well, then you are going to banish the terrible thoughts out of your air, out of your fire, out of your water, out of your earth. And likewise, if you're asking for thought to come help you out, to come bring you knowledge, then you're going to invoke Thoth in your air. You're going to invoke Thoth, Thoth in your fire. You're going to invoke Thoth in your water, and you're going to invoke Thoth in your earth. So it's the same process, but you're just doing it the opposite way of doing the pentagram. Now, if this is not right, if this is not in the book you read, if this is not in the books I read, well then, don't listen to me, but this is what I do, and it fucking works, because I invoke Thoth. And from there, I get these lessons and I get this knowledge and I put it out here and I have so much more and so many books and it's been so helpful. And you know, the argument can be made that I'm just stealing this from other people or I'm just reading this or just coming to these conclusions by fucking whatever. But only being reading, only have been in the occult for two years and knowing what I know and I go out there and I look at people that talk about stuff and they've been in the occult for five years and it's like, man... You should have known that like a year ago. But people don't learn at the same rates. There's things I'm not going to be good at that other people are going to be good at. And there's things that people are going to be good at or not good at that I'm going to be good at. And this is probably one of those. I just, I really enjoy finding correspondences between things. I really enjoy dissecting things and figuring them out, which can also hinder me. Because if I overthink about something like I had with the push and pull, <laughs> like, understanding that you know whenever the waning moon when you're supposed to banish stuff and during the waxing moon you're supposed to ask for stuff but to me like my left hand is pulling things towards me i want to pull money towards me i don't want to fucking push money away from me and that's why i was looking at it you know and i was over analyzing it over analyzing it until i finally light bulb clicked on and i figured out how i needed to do it for my energetic makeup and it works and it finally fucking took off but it took me a while because of this this talent, that can be a fucking curse that overanalyze shit. So don't get too stuck in your head. But that's how you start the process to, to invoke thoughts. Now, do you have to do that? Probably not. You can probably do a regular banishing and just make your fucking stars whatever way you fucking want and all that. And just fucking middle pillar it up and then say, hey, Thoth, 
It's Wednesday, buddy. Uh, it's your hour. I really appreciate it if you could help me out. I really want to know some shit, and that might work. You know, I would go around the route saying, hey, it's awesome. I'm so grateful and loving, and I fucking thank you from the bottom of my heart. This candle, this incense is for you. I'm going to light fucking three more later today for you, bud. I'm going to do some research and fucking find out what you like because I am so fucking grateful for all the fucking knowledge and wisdom you gave me. You really changed my life. I, I fucking love you, man. Thank you. Act like a fucking fan. Now, you don't have to worship them. You don't have to worship shit, okay? You don't have to worship shit like gods. That's that's one distinction I will make. I don't worship um, any of these planetary bodies and shit like that. I am grateful. I am respectful. I am loving. I am thankful. I do not worship them because I know they are above me, below me, and within me. So to worship them is to worship me, and then I'm going to get all proud and maybe have pride and then fucking fall like Lucifer and shit like that. Um, so I don't worship. I don't worship anybody. I, I Like I said, a birch fucking freighter morrison all these fuckers that i have on my show i just talk about blavatsky i love that chick i don't worship any of these fuckers they're not fucking idols to me i don't believe in idol worship i think god in the bible had it bang on when now should not worship any idols now he fucked up when he said except for me and you shouldn't worship him either you should be grateful loving and thankful to your god for everything he's done for you, whoever your god or goddess is, all that is. But you don't have to fucking worship them. They don't want you to worship them. They want your prayers. They want your love. They want your gratitude. So they keep giving you shit, but they don't need your worship. They don't need you to put them above yourself and fuck up your life. Or start judging people and saying, I need to worship God. You need to worship God. That is just my opinion. You know, and if you look at worship in a different way, that is not how I'm describing it. Then keep worship, keep worshiping, okay? So if your worship is, if worship to you is the definition of worship is, you know, being loving, being respectful, being grateful, being thankful, then that's fine. Leave it at that and do keep worshiping. But if worship means that you're going to fucking give everything to your God and only do what God says for you to do and this and that and the other thing, then no. Because there's many gods and there's many goddesses. And if you're only worshipping one, then you're fucking lacking the other fucking six if we're talking about the planetary gods. And there's way more things that you can fucking throw in the mix than just the seven planetary gods because there's also the other fucking ones. Uranus, Neptune, fucking Pluto. You know, technically the moon's not even a fucking planet, but we have fucking people are going to worship just the moon? Well, there's the Dianics. They're out of balance. You're going to worship just Saturn? There's the fucking Jews. They're out of balance. You're going to worship the fucking sun? Christians, you're out of fucking balance. You know, can't worship. If you worship one, you got to worship them all. And by worshiping them all, then you might be in balance because you're worshiping all these different aspects. So maybe that would be okay, but I just like to think of it as in I just, I'm grateful, I'm loving, I'm respectful of them. And to me, if you're being respectful, you're being thankful, you're fucking grateful, and you love them, then th- that, that's enough. That's enough. You don't need to worship them. But anyways, so that's how I would pull off. Uh, that's how I did my invocation, basically. And, you know, I may have specified exactly what I wanted to do and what I wanted to do with it. And when I say that, it's in the same way as, that, as if it's already happened, you know. And I would have done this for, at that time, I would have did it probably for three weeks every day. Because it was so important to me. And then I let it go. Two weeks during the, the the waning phase or the waxing phase. And then one week during the waning phase. It's probably roughly what I did. And it wouldn't have been exactly a week in the, the waning phase. It would have fucking flowed into there. Depending on the days. I would have started it right at the fucking new moon. And then... And ended it, you know, you know, whatever 21 days was. And the reason I say that is because 21 days to start a new, uh, to start a new, um, habit. So I wanted this to be a habit. I wanted my mind to do it. When I didn't want to do it, I put it on a recorder. And when I stopped doing it, I listened to it at night probably for another three weeks. So I did 21 days times two. This is probably what I did. Um, I don't look at my notes, but I'm pretty fucking positive that's exactly what I did. Because when it comes to certain magics that I really, and passionate about and I really want I'm not just going to do three spells which is which is the norm I use the number three and sometimes I'll do a week but for the most part I'll do three spells for the same thing um, because I, there's power in the number three um, but I'll do three fucking spells for whatever I want and then I let it go and I work on another spell how I let go of my spell and stop thinking about it 
well, I have absolute faith it's going to happen. I am so deep into this stuff that it's not even a rabbit hole anymore. The rabbit hole is my life. You know, people say they get down this truth path, the magic path, and they fall down the rabbit hole. And that's just because they're overwhelmed and they don't know what to believe. You know, their program is fucking them up. They, they're so into this stuff that um, the rabbit hole is becoming my life. Um, you know, I do believe you do have to hide your magic and stuff like that from your wife, but because my wife knows about it, and yeah, it may cause fights and all that, at least it's now my normal. You know, I'm not all magic all the time, but I, I believe that everything I do, everything I put on a candle, everything I program the water to do, everything I do with my fucking incense, anything I do with the earth outside, anything I say or anything I program my mind, anything I record, everything, anything I do with fucking voodoo fucking dolls hoodoo dolls whatever which i don't really do much um i haven't actually did a doll per se but i've done things out of wax for people for myself and shit like that for me to get rid of addictions and the wantings of addictions and shit like that um but i i everything i do i know it's gonna happen so there's no reason for me to dwell on it or even worry about when it's gonna come the only time it does happen is if it's something for money and my wife wants to go borrow or is worried about money so then you know that's this when it comes up like oh fuck yeah i did that spell how long ago was that i'll think about that and then i fucking switch it up boom give me an emotion happy emotion body come on i need something good and then i fucking act like it already happened i switch it right up you know i was like oh fuck when did i do that oh shit i'm getting all fucking upset and mad and sad about it like oh shit didn't happen and i switch it right away like oh no it did fucking happen yeah and i'm thinking about the first time you know i fell in love the first time fucking i got teary-eyed over whatever you know i i already had videos about this i have channeled i have uh, emotions uh on demand that i use for as soon as i start thinking about my manifestation especially if it hasn't happened yet i channel a happy loving emotion so it gets my magnetic fucking field my heart your heart that pulls out that magnetic field or the electric all field the electric uh, electricity that comes out there's two different kinds of electricities in my body i already have a video about this as well the electric one's the one that pushes things away your magnetic ones pulls away right it's the same thing your push and pull your right hand your left hand all that bullshit i already talked about so i channel those emotions and uh, I I think about my thing as if it already happens and in this way I let it go again you know so anytime it creeps up on me I don't want to stump my magic maybe this is why it happens so fast for me now because every time it pops up in my head this is what I do this is what I train myself to do and once again I train it through habit every time it happened I fucking made myself do that even like oh fuck what's the point what's the point no 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 of course do it fuck now you know my brain because of all the different programs I put in there through repetition through uh, like literally saying to myself an affirmation over and over again that my manifestations happen three times faster than, they're, they're, than they used to. All right, that's probably triggering that fucking voice in my head to say, "No, Corey, fucking do it now. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna regret it if you don't." So I'm like, "Okay, no, the voice knows best." So I listen to the voices in my head and I move on. But anyways, back to back to that thing I put on. So like I said prior, um. Well, uh, that's whenever that one of those ads were on. Um, I talked about the Babylonians and all that. And I love Babylonians. Um, I like reading about the Babylonians, even in the Bible. Um, even though the Bible is condemning it most of the time. But I do like reading about it because um, I feel it's one of those things like witchcraft, like ceremonial magic, um, like all that. Anything that's opposed to Christianity, they've, I don't want to say demonized, but that is certainly the case. Um but they've turned it into, you know, oh, they were worshipping demons, so they had to be destroyed. They were worshipping demons, so they had to be destroyed. Nowadays, it's they're worshipping demons, let's repent for them, let's pray for them, and let's try to change them. But back then, it was, they were worshipping demons, we had to fucking kill them, because those demons would have killed us first. That was the fucking cop-out excuse. Now, please, if you are a Christian and you're watching this, that's cool. I am too. Uh, I just don't believe in what our religion did. I don't believe in what they did back then. I don't believe in justifying killing all these fucking people who technically didn't give a fuck about what you were doing, but you took it upon yourself to give a fuck about what they're doing because they're getting better results. And the priest said, no, no, no. I'm the only one that gets to be between you and God. You don't get to be between you and God. You can go home and pray and do some Hail Marys and shit like that, but you can't do the real praying like I do. So, so no, no, no. Go kill these fuckers. They shouldn't be doing that either. You're not allowed to do it. Why should they be doing it? And, oh, yeah, that's right. 
What the fuck? We're not allowed to do that. Why would they do that? Let's go kill them. Like, fuck off. Come on, you fucking hypocrites. It'd be different if they were going after them and shit like that. Once again, I don't know. Maybe the Babylonians started it. Maybe they did. I doubt it. Maybe they did. And just, ah, oh, such crap. You know, it happened back then. And then it happened from 14 to 1600 where they went around killing witches. Like, history just keeps repeating itself. And, you know, no matter what they do, this knowledge just keeps getting back out there. You'd think they would have figured it out by now that it's in the fucking astral plane, like they said. It's in our minds. Anybody who's passed on, you know, if you believe in reincarnation, they're back. So it's still there. <laughs> it's still imprinted in their soul's DNA, however you want to think about it. So, you know, some of these priests today might have been a fucking magician way back when. Who knows? I don't know how reincarnation works. I'm not going to pretend I do. I already said my opinion on what I think. So, therefore, if those people evolved, they wouldn't be here anymore. But they'd be the ones helping us out. They'd be the ones whispering in our ear saying, no, there's a better way. Go look up magic. <laughs> so there's no way this shit's ever gonna get fucking suppressed it's never gonna go away and that's why i'm trying to fucking help it along because i don't want to see something end up going to war when it doesn't need to when the people fighting magic could just literally look at somebody like fucking freighter xavier who just explains all you're doing is using your more powerful mind to make what you want happen in your life that more powerful mind is more gullible, though, unfortunately, and it's been tricked into thinking these silly things that aren't going to help you. So all I'm trying to do is train you to use your more powerful mind to make things happen in your life so it's not so gullible anymore, so you protect it because you're supposed to protect it. Treat it like it's your child. Treat it like it's you. That's why people say you need to work on your inner child. New Age says you need to get, get in touch with your inner child. Jesus said you need to be like children to enter the kingdom of fucking heaven. It's, it's all the same shit. You need to get in touch with that inner child. That inner child got fucked up as a kid. Your parents told you you weren't good enough or your parents told you that, oh, that was just a dream or you didn't see this and you fucking got fucked up because of it. You suppressed all these emotions and now it's stunting your fucking life. And so you got to get in touch with that inner child and you got to let it fucking free. You got to tell it, no, it's okay. You were right. Your fucking parents were wrong. And when you do that, you're going to be liberated and you're going to feel great. And if you have some really bad trauma, then yeah, you're going to you're gonna probably need to go see a psychologist, unfortunately. But if you're like me, who your parents just did what they thought was right and you know that they loved you, then you don't have to worry about that. You can reprogram your own mind. Don't listen to anybody that tells you you need to go see a psychiatrist because you don't. You can fix it yourself. However, it's going to take more time. A psychiatrist will cut the time probably in half if they do it right, maybe even faster. So I don't want to take away from anybody. Once again, it's the same concept. You can do magic for free. Or you can figure all this shit out for free, but it's going to take you a lot of time. Or you can go over to Freighter or fucking Uncle Birch and pay for a program, and you're going to do it in half the time. But it's going to cost you. And it might cost you, you know, it could cost your wife if she finds out you're fucking buying magical shit and she doesn't believe in that. And then all of a sudden she finds out that you're doing this. So that's a judgment call on you. If you can fucking afford to, if you have the money to do it, then it's probably worth doing it because it's going to save you time. But if you don't have the money to do it or you can't actually go and do something that you like because out of fear of losing your loved ones or, or judgment or whatever, then you're going to have to put in the time and figure out your fucking own problems and go on it. And that's why guys like me are on here because that's what I had to do. I couldn't go out there and buy a fucking magic program if I wanted to. Well, I couldn't. I still probably can't. I had to figure this shit out on my own and try to fucking do it on my own because I didn't want my wife to know or I didn't want her to judge or I didn't want her to get freaked out and all that. Plus, we have things we need to spend our money on that's you know arguably more important than magic, which the magic could bring more money. But still, how do you explain that to somebody who doesn't believe in it? And it's not their fault they don't believe in it. It's not anybody's fault they don't believe in it. But anyways, that's, that's my mission. I'm on here trying to teach people how to do this shit themselves if they can't trying to save you that time that I had to take. But I was blessed with it. I got the time off. I got to stay home and get paid and learn all this shit. I, I got to, to not have to work the job to do this research and get this information and put these videos out here, put these recordings out here because these are the recordings and videos that helped me out. So if you're wondering if I'm doing this just to fucking kill time or just to be on the radio, and that's not the point. It does help. But it's not the point. I saw this thing and it made me look into Crowley. It made me look into Thoth. It made me look into um, Blavatsky, which 
brought me to Manny P. Hall, which brought me to, oh, what's the other philosopher's name? He's fucking important. Um, Watts, Watts, um, fuck, Alan Watts. Um, fucking, those guys are awesome as philosophers and theosophers. Um, and it brought, you know, it maybe led me down all these alleys. And if you're reading the book, Kabbalah and this great work of self transformation, within that book, it tells you to look up. Um, I think there's like two or three Egyptian books, and there's a book on the middle pillar just in the neophyte grade. That's just the first grade. So, it's important if you already have that done before you start the curriculum. Well, then you're gonna be, you know, you'll be okay. You know, you start reading that book, and if it's the same shit you already know, well, then you're good. You know, you don't have to read it. Now you but you should start a book. Make sure it is the stuff you know because there's a lot of information on Egypt out there that's not cool and not true. But anyways, um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that today. I can't go any longer because I don't want them to cut any of this crap off. Um, my last episode, I didn't really get into um. On Magic on a Budget, I wrote the title, and it was supposed to be all the things I've already mentioned on how to do magic and, like, breaking them down. But I didn't really break it down. I just named everything at the end and then gave a few examples of a couple. So it was kind of shitty. And the reason was I was getting – my daughter was misbehaving. She's having some teeth issues. She's teething, and it's brutal. So whenever I'm up here doing my radio show – (laughs) <laughs> if my wife is the only one downstairs dealing with it, all I can do here is her screaming down there. And my wife's not coming up and asking me to help or anything like that. But, you know, I feel bad. So I kind of rushed off the air because of that last time. I'm not trying to give excuses. But um, the next episode I make on Magic on a Budget is going to be addressing that. It's going to be the first thing I do. I'll probably take, you know, half an hour to an hour, whatever it takes to address every one of those issues because I know I kind of left that half ass and I don't want to leave anything in half ass. Like I said, my job here is to teach everybody how to do the reprogramming of their mind, to do the magic on their own, by themselves, without having to go places. If Because not everybody, there's going to be people that's going to say, no, this guy's going to teach me? Fuck it, it's worth the money. And I agree 100%. If I could have done that, I would have done that. But there's other people that are in the same boat that are willing to take the time and learn it themselves or they can't afford and can't tell a significant other that they want to go buy magical programs because they are you know strict christians or strict judaism or strict jewish or strict you know muslim or whatever the case may be well that's who i'm here to help those are the people that i want to help so anyways i'm going to break all those things down on the next magic on a budget uh show i'm going to say tomorrow is when i'm going to do that there's a chance it could be tonight but I like doing two shows a day. I was really having fun doing that and actually have the biggest response. Like I have uh, 300 uh, you know, views in one day a couple times when I did that and 200 and 200 and 200 around those days. And the further you get from those days, it goes down to 100. And I'm at about 90, 90 uh, downloads and 90 plays a day right now, which is pretty fucking awesome. You know, I'm pretty stoked about that. But I've had days where I'm at. 300 downloads or 300 well between downloads and plays on demand okay i'm at i've had days uh, 390 actually it's almost 400 it's pretty sick but that's the closest that's the highest number i have it's around july 3rd um i think it's when i was doing all the manny p not manny p hall jesus all the uh, earl nightingale stuff and some greg barden stuff is when i have the highest hits and i was doing like two shows uh, one on each channel or two shows on the one channel or two shows on the other channel. So uh, I would try to get back to that. I have, have uh, got the bigger package. But now that I have the bigger package, I'm not sure if it's for me. I think I'm better off with less time because I'm doing still only 45 minutes of talking and I'm adding big long clips in there, which is handy if it's stuff I think people need to hear or see. And I don't think people can actually go see it. But I think there's some people out there that can't for some reason get that stuff. You know, it's like they only have enough money to have itunes or something so they're downloading this stuff and learning it from itunes so that's why maybe i put this on here for them i don't know and i could be wrong um or they just don't have the time you know because i get in those stages where it's like i need to listen to something new and you learn something new but then i just put on the same old crap and you know okay i'm still programming my mind and reinforcing these ideas in my mind so it's not a waste of time but Sometimes, and if you, someone just tells you to go watch something or they put it on their channel and you're, you have no choice but to do it, you know. So anyways, uh, this is uh, the newest uh, ceremony of witchcraft. Check out the Magic on a Budget uh, show I put out yesterday. Um, like I said, there's a bunch missing from the front of, front of it, uh, the beginning of it. It starts right with, um, right with Grant Morrison, but super helpful for sigil magic. It's how to do sigil magic. 
It's literally, he tells you word for word how to fucking do it in there. And then I talk about sigil magic and a bunch of other different magics. And I break down uh, what he said in there and a few different things and how to do it, how to reprogram your mind, what it meant, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, you should really check it out. It's a long fucking episode, but it's not the full three hours that it says it is. It's really only uh, like two hours, to be honest. In the first 45 minutes or 40 minutes is all just Grant Morrison talking on stage. If you want to skip that and go right to my voice, cool. Or you don't want to hear my voice, just listen to Grant. I suggest that actually more than mine. I'm not supposed to be self-defecating, but I'm just saying he's got some... It's nice to hear from some rich fucker who made money and he's telling you he did it using magic. You know how powerful that is for your fucking brain to hear? When your brain hears that this rich fucker made comic books and the comic books became fucking super sigil because the things he did in the comic book happened to him well then he made comic books to make himself rich and that's what happened this is what he's telling everybody and if you don't hear that in there well then you need some work to do but that's what he's telling you it's fucking amazing it's so powerful for your subconscious to hear that you can make something out of pretend and it will become real and that's what magic is anyways hope you guys enjoyed have a great night
begins. I will never ask if yet, don't ever tell me. I know you well enough to know you never love me. Why can't I feel anything? I will never ask if yet, don't ever tell me. I know you well enough to know you never love me. Why can't I feel anything? I will never ask if yet, don't ever tell me. I know you well enough to know you never love me. Why can't I feel anything? I will never ask if yet, don't ever tell me. I know you well enough to know you never love me. Why can't I feel anything?
for you She's not the one coming back for you If I fall back down You don't want to help me back home again If I fall back down You don't want to be my friend If I fall back down You don't want to help me back home again If I fall back down
music? Just ever! Killed everyone. Come away forever. But I'm feeling better. What do I feel? What do I say? Fuck you, it all goes away. What do I feel? What do I say? Fuck you, it all goes away.
That shit done change Ever since we was on I dreamed it all Ever since I was young They said I won't be nothing Now they always say congratulations Worked so hard, forgot how 
to vacation They ain't never had the dedication People hate me, say we changing, look, we made it Yeah, we made it That was never friendly, yeah Now I'm jumping out of Bentley, yeah And I know I sound dramatic, yeah But I know I had to have it, yeah For the money, I'm a savage, yeah I be itching like I had it, yeah I'm surrounded 20 bad bitch, yeah But they didn't know me last year, yeah Everyone wanna act like they important But all that mean nothing when I saw my door, yeah Everyone counting on me, drop the ball, yeah Everything custom like I'm at the bottom, yeah, yeah If you fuck with winning, put your lattice to the sky How could I make sense when I got millions on my mind? Coming with that bullshit, I just put it to the side Bought a sense of baby, they could see it I'm a call, see you on TV Son, that shit done change Ever since we was on, I dreamed it all Ever since I was young, they said I won't be nothing Now they always say congratulations, congratulations. Worked so hard, forgot how to vacation They ain't never had the dedication People hating, say we changing, look, we made it Yeah, we made it Now I can scream that we made it Now everywhere, everywhere I go, they say congratulations Young nigga, young nigga, graduation I pick up the rock and I ball, baby I'm looking for someone to call, baby But right now I got a situation Never old Ben, Ben Franklin Big rings, champagne My life is like a ball game But instead I'm in a trap, though Paso Big, call it Super Bowl Super Bowl, call the hoes Rose. Top flow lifestyle, top hot and post. Yeah. Malone, Aye. I gotta play on my phone. Aye. You know what I'm on. Hunter who did it is gone. Aye. My mama called, see you on TV. Sunset shit done changed. Ever since we was on our.